Welcome to this video. Today we'll be looking at um, economics paper 12, October, November 2020. All right, let's start. All right, so the first question, um, it's about a uh, production possibility curve or a pos production possibility frontier, but uh, we just drop the name to PPC. So what can we deduce from the shape of this curve? All right, so for PPC, we will have two curves. The first one would be this one, which is a straight line that goes through both the y-axis and the x-axis. And then the second one would be something like this, which I'll well, yeah, put a zero. And then there'll be something like this, this is a curve shape graph. Curve shape graph means that it uh, it's a bit different. It's an increasing opportunity cost, right? Because of the of the curve nature, right? So in this case, um, either you have constant opportunity cost, which is this one, and then we have increasing opportunity cost, which is this one. And so for this question, we'll look at the options that are given. First one, it says is decreasing marginal returns to consumption. Um, because this is a, this is an AS AS syllabus server uh, paper, marginal returns is uh, in A two, so um, A is out of the question. And then for B, it says is decreasing opportunity cost of consumption. The national possibility curve uh, is actually to show how many items you can produce, how many of this good and how many of this good you can produce, basically to maximum combination of two goods, maximum combination of two goods that can be produced at a given, uh, in an economy. So in this case, um, if it says consumption, that is definitely wrong. And then D, increasing returns to scale is also wrong as well, because like I said, for this one, it's actually to determine the production possibility of, you know, the maximum combination of two goods that can, that can be produced in an economy. So the right answer will be C, which is increasing opportunity cost of production. All right, so for question two, and uh, which statement is correct? So, okay, private goods are both non-rival and non-excludable. This is definitely wrong. The the only um uh few goods that are non-rival and non-excludable are public goods and free goods. The difference between public goods and free goods is, uh, public goods, if you produce them, it will result in an op opportunity cost because you need to use class resources to produce public goods. But free goods are goods that won't decrease in amount if you, if let's say a certain amount of people use them. And then, okay, let's look at B. Private goods are only provided by the private sector. And not really. <clears throat> private goods can also be provided by the public sector. It doesn't really have to limit the, you know, the sectors that will be providing the public, uh, private goods. For example, um, there are certain cases where uh, you know, our uh, private goods can also be provided by the uh, public sector, but in most cases, private goods are provided by the private sector. So this is not really accurate. And then C, public goods are both non-rival and non-excludable. So can, like what I said just now, the two main types of goods that are both non-rival and non-excludable are public goods and free goods. So this matches the specifications, but let's look at D. Public goods do not incur opportunity costs. This is definitely wrong. Public goods would would incur opportunity costs because you require scarce resources to produce them, right? So it does result in opportunity costs. So D is wrong. I say C. Again, question three. We have two statements. A rise in the price of rice is the best way to give farmers in Southeast Asia higher living standards. Uh, right. So, uh, it's the best way. So now we need to look at the main, the main point of this entire sentence, which is is the best way. This is like, um, this is not testable. Uh, it is based on your own opinion. You think that it's the best way, but it doesn't exactly have to be the best way, right? And then a rise in the price, price of rice will lead to a fall in demand. This is testable, right? You can use a graph to test it, right? So assuming that, um, uh, let's see, um, you could technically test it if you, if let's say the price of rice increased. Because like we have PED, we have XED, we also have YED, right? So uh, it also depends on if the rice is a necessity or if the price, of, if the rice is a, uh, it's a necessity or is it if you're good. But no, most of the cases, rice price is considered as a necessity, and then uh, an increase in the price of rice would lead to a decrease in demand, right? So this is for the you know, price elasticity. So definitely this is testable. And so for number two, it's positive statement. Number one is negative statement. So answer is B. Okay, four. 
Uh, this is no longer in uh, the AS syllabus, but uh, okay, I'll try to do it. So what is the characteristic of money, but not a function of money? So function of money means that uh, what use is it? Like, what's the use? So, okay, so for this one, uh, media by exchange is a characteristic of money and is also a function. The function is that you can use it to exchange stuff. Yep, so this is both characteristic of money and also a function of money. And then B, portability. Yes, it's portable, but that's not a function of money. It's a characteristic. You can bring money around you if you want to. But then that's it. It's just portable. But it doesn't really give a function, right? And then C, standard of deferred payment. That means that you can use it to pay for things. Yep. It is a standard, which is, means, means that is, the characteristic is that it is a standard of deferred payment. And the function is that you can use it to pay for things, right? So C is a uh, characteristic and also a function. And store value. Yes, money, the characteristic of money is that it can store value. And the function is to store value. So D is correct as well, so answer is. Okay, number five. In the UK, attempts to encourage people to change from road to rail travel by the introduction of a system of road pricing were forecast to have little effect because people like using their cars too much. So when when you can, when you see statements like this one, like it says people like using their cars too much. This indicates that uh, no matter how much you try to decrease rail prices or increase stations or you know, the rail network, people will still use cars because they just simply like to drive cars. That tells you that if let's say um, I were to, let's say there's an increase in the price of cars, uh, people will still buy them, although it's a smaller amount compared to the increase in the price of cars. So the, de the, amount, the, decrease in, the amount that decreases is actually substantially lower than the increase in the percentage of uh, price. So in this case, that means that the price scarcity of uh, demand for cars must be very, very low. So this has to be a uh, PED in plastic. In this case, I'm talking about cars. All right, so let's look at the four selections. The price of the of demand for cars is high. This is definitely wrong. Uh, price of the of demand for cars is, if it's high, that means it's elastic. That means that when there's an increase in the price of cars, there'll be a huge, there'll be a larger decrease in the quantity demanded. But in this case, no. B, the price of the of demand for petrol is high. Petrol is a complement to cars. You need to have petrol in order for your car to move. So B is wrong. Then C, the price of the of demand for rail travel is low. Which definitely is not right because, like 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 the sentence that Bernie mentioned, attempts to encourage people to change from road to road travel was forecast to have little effect. Which means that even if you try to change, uh, you know, pricing or you know, road pricing, people will still use that cars regardless. I mean, there may be some people that will that will leave, that will choose not to take cars anymore because of the higher prices. But they're just leaving some people out. And, it's, and then that some people will not account to the total increase in the percentage of pricing. So PED for road travel is just is quite high. And then D, yes, this is correct. Like what I mentioned, this now PED in last signal cost. And then six, the demand shows the demand curve for product with um, unitary price at 60, which means that PD equals to one. And what will happen with such a curve? So A, a fall in price will bring about an increase in total expenditure on the product. So if PED is one, that means that regardless of how much your price and quantity has changed, the total revenue, uh, the total expenditure will still be the same. Like, let's say for example, I purchase uh, uh, 10 of these, uh, 10 of good A, that will be $5. And then let's say the price decreased to, uh, let's say the price increased to, uh, uh, like I increase it to a certain quantity, but then the my total expenditure will still be $50. $50. Right, so the total explanation will still be the same. So here we look at these four selections. The foreign price will bring about an increase in total expansion. This will be wrong. Um, this will only happen if the PD is more than one, which means that it's elastic, relatively elastic. A foreign price will bring about an increase in sales, but a fall in total expansion on the product. This is when uh, the PD is less than one, which means that it's relatively inelastic. So this is also wrong. As the price rises, total expansion on the product will stay the same. Yeah. This is true. And let's look at D first. As the price rises, total expansion on the product will rise and then fall. Uh, this would be inaccurate. And this is definitely wrong. So answer is C. Great. Let's look at seven. The diagram shows the market supply and demand for good. Now, which area represents producer surplus? Producer surplus is the difference between what the, the producer is willing and able to supply at a given price and then the price that he actually sells it for. 
So in this case, the if you look at this graph, the consumer surplus would be S, and then the consume the producer surplus would be T. So which area represents uh, producer surplus? That would be that would be T. So it's B. All right, and then for eat. Vanilla is an important ingredient in the production of ice cream. Between 2011 and 2018, the price of vanilla increased from about $100 per kilogram to nearly $600 per kilogram. So, the price of vanilla has increased, which means that the supply decreases. Because if, let's say, the price of vanilla increased, uh, that means the cost of production increases. When your cost of production increases, you can only make less of the, of the particular good. And in this case, only the supply curve shifts to the left and nothing else shifts because that's the only statement that we have, right? So the answer is C. When you look here, the demand curve remains the same, but the supply curve has now shifted from S1 to S2, right? Let's look at nine. A garden reduces income tax, but at the same time raises the rate of sales tax. Okay, reduce income tax and raises rate of sales tax. So what are the likely effects of a demand and supply of the normal good? So when you reduce income tax, uh, your demand increases because when you reduce income tax, that means that you have higher uh, purchasing power or higher disposable income. So when you have a higher disposable income, your demand curve will shift to right. You'll buy more of that good, all right, and then yeah, you buy more of that good, and your demand increases. Uh, but at the same time, your rate of sales tax increase. So when your rate of sales tax increase, that means that your cost of production increase. When your cost of production increase. So suppliers have no choice, but yeah, they have to shift the supply curve to the left. So you'll be something like this, right? So you end up being from D and S to D1, S1. So the supply decreases, so I'll say C. Right. With 10, an increase in the popularity of air conditioning units has resulted in the price increasing by 20%. In response, the quantity supply increased by 30%. All right, so this is PES that we need to calculate. So percentage change of QS over percentage change of P, 30% over 20%. <clears throat> That will be 1.5. So that means that the PES is more than 1. So I'll say it's more. Each change does not have an immediate effect on the position of the demand curve for a product. Okay, so this one, let's see. Um, a fall in the pr price of a complementary product would also result in... Uh, like, okay, so for complementary product, complements, right? So that means that uh, it's... So the XCD will be negative. So percentage change in QDX over percentage change in PY. Assuming that, okay, so this will be a negative number, okay, negative value. So let's say there's a fall in price. This means that, uh, this means that there would be an opposite to it, which means that this would be, there will be an increase in the, in the QDX. So let's say I, let's say, uh, okay, let's say it's negative one. This one is decreasing by 20%. Uh, yeah, so that'll be something like this. This one will be a negative value, as I assume, assume it's negative one. For this one, it says it falls by 20%. So I move it over, it become 20%. So there's a 20% increase in quality of that, and then there's a negative 20% decrease in price. So it does have an immediate effect on the position of the income curve. So this one is, it will have an immediate effect. And then for B, a range of new pronouns entering the market. Um, if there's a range of new products entering the market, you, depending on uh, what product that is, if, it, if they are similar, that means that your competition will increase. And yes, it will affect the position of the market curve, that's the case. So, yeah. And then for C, uh, a rise in the labor cost of its production. A rise in its labor cost of production. So if let's say there's a rise in the labor cost of its production, it will affect the supply curve, but it does not affect the demand curve. It will not have an immediate effect on the demand curve. It will have an immediate effect on the supply curve. So this one would be the answer, but let's look at D. An increase in the price of the subsidiary product. If there's an increase in the price of the subsidiary product, then the demand for the uh, the particular not substitute product, the, the, the original product would increase. So D would have an immediate effect on the demand curve. So I'll say C. Right. When demand for the falls, it price falls. What is the function of the price fall? Uh, so what is the function? Um, when demand for the good falls, that would be something like this. The price falls. Uh, right, so what is the function of price fall to the initial did this? That would be incorrect. We're talking about price function here, so 
what is the function of the price fall to reduce the super surplus? If let's say you reduce the super surplus, that is the effect of when the price falls, the demand curve shifts to the left. It's, it's not really a function, it's more like an effect. And then C to set a single of the producers is possible, so we'll leave it there first with the CD to stimulate a further fall in demand. But the amount of fall already falls, and so that's not the function of the price fall. We do not want the uh, demand to fall even further, so this is wrong as well, so I'll say C. Okay, number 13. A firm estimates that the price of the supply of this product is 0.4. It means that the PES is inelastic, right? So should the firm be concerned by this figure? So let's look at the four options here. A, it says no, as it implies that the firm will be able to raise revenue by raising prices. A uh, firm will be able to raise revenue by raising prices. That is, uh, uh, that is actually inaccurate because that will only happen if your PD is inelastic. If your PD is inelastic, when you increase prices, you will have an increase in total revenue. But in this case, no. Because your PES is uh, inelastic, which means that you cannot keep up with the changes in the, uh, in the quantity supply when there's a change in price. You can't be very responsive. So either you have a decrease in productive capacity or either you have items that are perishable or either your product requires very skilled labor. Right? So, so this A is in for, for question, uh, for selection A is inaccurate. And then B, uh, no one as it suggests that there are a few substitutes for the product. Um, well, basically, um, that won't be inaccurate. So A, B is also wrong. And then for C, yes, as it means that demand for its product is increasing at a slow rate. Uh, well, that is also not correct because here we're talking about PES, not PED. So the answer would be D. Yes, as it shows that the firm is not able to adjust supply easily when demand changes. Yep. So, like like what I mentioned, uh, you you need to let's say it's inelastic supply that means that the firm is not able to adjust supply easily. It's not very responsive to changes in price, right? So answer is D. And then, uh, let's look at fourteen. Um, yeah, a government decides to privatize a state-owned company. So what should the government do to try to ensure that this will result in the improvement in efficiency? So you're, you're trying to privatize a state-owned company, which means that it's privatization. Instead of actually having the, the government to operate, you know, it's the, the, you know, a, a private entity. So A, allowing vouchers to, allocating vouchers to all citizens and them to share of the ownership, which is not correct. Because now you're trying to improve the efficiency <clears throat> and so this has really less, not, not much to do about, you know, increasing the efficiency. So A is not correct. And B, encourage competition, meaning that you have many other companies competing with you. Yes, this is accurate. Let's look at the others first. Impose the maximum profit margin, which is definitely not correct. If you impose the maximum profit margin, it will definitely decrease the efficiency because it'll be like, oh, I just need to earn this certain amount of profits and I can just, you know, pay back, relax. So of course, this is not correct. Increased business tax rate will result the supply curve to shift to the left, which results in a decrease in efficiency. So D is definitely, I'd say it's B. Okay, 15. The graph shows an individual's income before and after the deduction of income tax. What is the marginal percentage rate of tax between $0 and $10,000 and between $10,000 and $20,000? Okay, so for 15, um, you see that when you increase um, until $10,000, the income before tax and income after tax is basically the same. This means that from zero dollars to ten thousand, the tax rate is basically zero. That means that, um, that means that you're not paying any tax at all. However, after ten thousand, you see that for the income before tax, which is at twenty thousand, the income after tax is seventeen thousand five hundred. So in this case, let's look at um, this one is yep. So you see here um. So between ten thousand and twenty thousand, this one we have to, uh, we have to, we have to take twenty thousand we minus by, uh, ten thousand. And then here, since so we are talking about marginal percentage rate of taxation, this one you can see that after taxes from twenty thousand becomes seventeen thousand five hundred, which means that the real tax that is taken is twenty five thousand uh, twenty two thousand five hundred, and then you divide. And then you get 25 over 100, which means 1 over 4, which also means if we, let's say, we multiply by 100, we'll get 
25 percent of answer is b all right and then for question 16 in year one in the market for a good representing the diagram the initial demand is the play is that d1 and s1 right so that means q2 p3 and the government has set the maximum price of op2 so when they set the maximum price of op2 the only thing that's going to happen is the equipment price will still remain the same because it's above equilibrium but demand increases to d2 so it shifts to the right but there are no other changes to conditional supply so supply is still the same or to the maximum price okay so at this point the maximum price is effective because it is below equilibrium now which rule actually shows the price and quantity in the market in each year so for year one uh so the price would be so the price would uh definitely be uh, op3 because like i said it's below equilibrium so there's Folks would normally will try to charge the item at a higher price. They will charge it at the equilibrium to make sure that the demand equals the supply because they want to make the most profits. So A, B is wrong. And that left, left, us with, left, left us with C and D. And then let's look at year two. Year two, you can see that because um, now the prices rise to P1, that's the equi equilibrium price. But then the maximum price is still set at P2. So in this case, C is wrong because the price is not OP1. So now it's OP3, OQ2, OP2, and also OQ3 because the supply is at uh, Q3. So there's a there's a shortage, right? So I'll say B. And then question 17, what is necessary for the action to be classified as a transfer payment? Uh, it doesn't exactly have to be a cash payment. It can be a cashless payment as well. It must involve a banking fraction, not exactly. It must originate from government activity, no, no, no. That means that it's income. It must relate from non-productive activity, which means no production takes place. For answer is D. Okay, 18. The market for good X is in equilibrium. The government introduced a subsidy to producers of good X. Under which conditions were total expansion by the government and subsidy delivery? This, right? So, so this one, let's see. So, I'm going to try and, um, I'm going to try it and try out every single possibility here. So here, the PD for good X is less than one. PS is also less than one. So I'm going to try something like this. And then here, I'm going to, um, so it says, it says that the total expansion will uh, have to be subsidized by the government. That means that when there's subsidy, it will be shifted to the right. It will be shifted to the right. The supply curve will shift to the right. So it'll be S1 and D. And then you can see that for this one, um, can see that this is gap, right? So well, this would be that. And then um, let's look at, um, I'm going to change the PES to uh, more than once. This time it's elastic, okay? Something like this, uh, but it's a bit far. Um, I'm going to shift to the right. This one S and S1, so it would be something like this. Okay, so this time you can see that the gap is a bit wider. I'm not sure if this is accurate or not, but it's a bit wider. And then, um, and then let's see. Uh, now we can change the demand uh, curve to elastic, and also the PS would be inelastic. So here, our PND would be more than one, so it'll be something like this. And then the PS would be less than one, so it'd be something like this. So you can see that for this one, assuming that the PS is the PD is uh in elastic uh something like this. So you see that the you can see the the price difference is a bit um yeah, it's just not there. And then, what about elastic and elastic? That will be, I go like this. Good. Yes, yes. Okay. So this is D, and then this one is S1, and this one is S. So, in theory, that basically means that, um, That basically means that under which conditions will the total expenditure be the greatest? That means that it will be that when PED and PS are both more than one, right? That means that the government 
would have to pay the most if let's say the price seal demand for good x is more than one and price seal supply is also more than one because uh the product itself is can be stored for a very long time and the p and let's say the prices decrease um that means that there'll be many more people actually going to purchase the products themselves so uh so the in this in this case right not only does the uh not only does the uh, the producer can actually automate can actually go and you know uh adjust accordingly to the changing market conditions the consumers themselves will also be able to do so so uh, in this case right the government will have to will have to be the one paying the most for the you know the subsidy in this case so this one answer is d all right let's look at 19. under which combi combination of circumstances will a policy of increasing the money supply be most effective and moving an economy on recession, all right? So, which circumstances? So, that means that we need to choose the the worst worst circumstance in this case. So, we have a depreciating exchange rate and the global financial crisis. Well, that's when that's we are, we are really in this condition. So, A is not really correct. B, we have a high nominal interest rate and depreciating exchange rate. This is possible. Let's look at C. Low aggregate demand and inflation rate above the target level. Um, so. If let's say we have an inflation rate above the target level and then we continue on increasing the money supply, there's a high chance, or I should say there's a chance that we will be we end up in hyperinflation. So this is not really good. And then low aggregate demand, increasing money supply will increase aggregate demand, but then still you will affect the inflation rate. So if you correct. Low nominal interest rate and no spare capacity available. So if there's no spare capacity available, that means that the PES is relatively inelastic. And then your low nominal interest rate, um, so if if you if you try to increase the money supply again, that means that you're actually just going to cause hyperinflation or maybe higher rates of inflation. This is not really accurate. But then we have high nominal interest rate and appreciating the exchange rate. That will be the best best condition, right? And then twenty, in which economic context is the term protectionism usually applied? Is protectionism is usually for for protecting domestic producers against foreign competition? So a the protection of consumers against excessive prices? Nope. Normally for protectionism, this would happen to protect domestic private firms in this case, mostly. So this would be either mixed economy or market economy, but mostly it should be mixed economy. B, the protection of employers against exploitation of multinational companies, not really. C, the protection of local producers against foreign competitors. Yes, this is possible and this may be the correct answer, but let's look at D. The protection of the foreign exchange rate against currency speculators. Uh, the protection of the foreign exchange rate against currency speculators, this one is um, not protectionism. Protectionism is to help local producers against foreign competitors, not really for exchange rate, right? So I'd say C. 21, what is most likely the cause of rise in a country's exchange rate? What is going to cause an exchange rate? So if let's say there's a fall in direct taxes, that means there's an increase in expense. There's a possibility that the AD will increase because of the increase in expenditure and investment and also in government expenditure. So this is not correct. Because normally when there's a rise in the exchange rate, there will also be a rise in interest rate and a decrease in money supply. So a fall in its export orders would actually um would actually result in if let's say there's a foreign export orders, that means that the uh that means that our mm -hmm. it is possible that our our AD would would decrease because um you know that exports will decrease. But in this case we're talking about um a rise in the the country's exchange rate. So B would be uh, let's look at but let's look at C first. A rise in its interest rate would result in an AD would result in AD curve shift to left. This is possible. A rise in its imports would result in uh would result in actually people actually converting their money out and then the exchange rate will actually decrease. So um nope. Okay, now I can understand why B is not correct. Because if there's a foreign is export orders, that means less people would actually exchange their currency for the you know the local currency to purchase the export to purchase the you know the international supplies from let's say produce uh, purchase the domestic items that we produce. So that means that um the demand for the exchange rate would actually decrease. A uh, demand for the currency would decrease. Right, so B is wrong. And say C. Okay, 22. The table shows an approximate summary of the current account balance payment for Thailand as the current account balance in US dollars. 
right? So exports would be positive and imports would be negative. So, uh, so we already have here the trade balance, which is, uh, which is 275. And then the net services, primary income and secondary income, which will be a positive value. So we just need to add these two together because exports and imports, the result will be the trade balance, which is 275. So 275 plus 1130, you get 1405. This is the current account balance, right? 23. The diagram shows the production possibility curves for two economies using all resources. Country X can produce 10 million cars or 20 million bicycles, and country Y can produce 20 million cars or 40 million bicycles. All right, so what statement is correct about country X and Y according to comparative advantage? So you can see here, um, so let's say I make one car. If let's say I make one car, that will be at the expense of two bicycles. Here, if let's say I make two cars, that will be at the expense of four bicycles, which means that both of them have the same, you know, they don't really have a comparative advantage in, in you know, the, if compared to two countries, they are the same. So in this case, if you, if we look at A, that's actually correct. And then we look at B, C, D, and we'll see why it's not correct. Country X has a lower opportunity cost ratio in producing cars in bicycle than country Y. Their opportunity cost is the same, right? Because if we divide it, that means it's one million car over two million cars, right? So in this case, country X and country Y have the same opportunity cost. So B is not correct. Country X has an absolute advantage over country Y in production of both rules, which is also not correct, right? Because if you divide it, you realize that it's almost the same thing. Although technically you could, technically you could produce more, but then still your the ratio itself would and will still be the same, right? And then for D, country one, we have faster economic growth than country X. Mm, not exactly. Not exactly. So the the correct one would be country X and country Y would not gain from free trade, right? So I'd say it's A. And then for question 24, let's see. A country has a balance of payments deficit if D values its currency, which combination leads to a reduction in the balance of payments deficit. But under the Marshall Learner condition, the only thing that will lead the possible way, possible thing for possible way for the balance of payments deficit to be reduced is that both the PED of exports and imports must be more than, must be combined, must be more than one. So A, B, and D are all wrong because less than 0 0.5 and less than 0 0.5, which means that it won't add up to one. Less than one and zero, so it's less than one. But C is more than 0 0.5, both are more than 0 0.5, so it's definitely going to be more than one. Zero and less than one, so it's less than one, so it's wrong as well, so I'll say C. Because under Marshall level condition, PED, X plus M must be more than one. Right, if you want to correct your balance of payments deficit. Okay, for question 25, the diagram shows aggregate demand curves AD1 and AD2 and aggregate supply curve AS1. So what could cause a shift in the aggregate demand curve from AD1 to AD2? So let's look at the four options that we have here. Okay, so A, a rise in the interest rate will result in a decrease in aggregate demand. So this is one. A rise in upper per worker will, be a result, will result in an increase in AS. So this is not AS, so this is not right. A rise in the budget deficit means more expenditure. So yes, this is possible. Let's look at D. A rise in the value of the exchange rate. Uh, a rise in the value of exchange rate will result in a decrease in AD because there'll be less uh, purchasing power or less uh, disposable income. So D is wrong. So answer is C. M26, um, the government of an open economy and all value currency decides to abandon its fixed exchange rate in favor of floating exchange rate. What macroeconomic policy aim is least likely to be met because of this change. All right, so what is the policy? So the pattern is fixed exchange rate for a floating exchange rate. So what is going to happen is there would be, um, so be a low level unemployment. It is possible that there'll be a low level unemployment because the currency is now floating exchange rate. So, it, so that means that if let's say it were, it were to depreciate that we won't want to supply, it's easier to hire people because of the increase in money supply. A reduced balance of payments deficit um, possible because um, your off your inflow is more than your outflow. It's possible, right? That uh, if I say it's depreciating, it's possible that there's a reduced balance of payments deficit because there's more money that is uh, in the country. A sustainable rate of economic growth uh, possible. So I'd say it's A. There's a high chance that the inflation rate may increase, right? So, uh, at least I need to be met would probably be the low inflation rate. Okay, 27, uh, deflation always has the effect of what? So when you, de when you have devaluation, 
your normally your uh, price of your exports should be relatively cheaper, and then your price of ex- your price of imports will be more expensive. So A is wrong, and B is wrong. Worsening the balance of payments. Balance of payments is basically the <coughs> basically the your total amount of transactions of residents of a country of a country with the entire world. The evaluation doesn't necessarily have to worsen the balance of payments. Right. So C is also wrong. Answer is D. Because when you devalue your money, that means your price of exports would be cheaper than your price of imports. Right. Okay, 28. And government uses monetary policy and fiscal policy to solve a problem of deflation. Which policy combination is likely to be the most successful? So a government uses monetary and fiscal policy to solve deflation, which means that they're using both, they'll be expansionary. So both expansionary means that first you have a decrease in interest rates, a decrease in exchange rate, and an increase in money supply. Fiscal policy, however, um, is also it's basically expansionary, but in this case that will be uh that will be an increase in expenditure and a decrease in taxation. So this one would be uh, reducing exchange interest rates and expansionary fiscal policy. I would say it's D. K29, a government reduces expenditure workplace training and then increases the level of indirect taxes and then reduces the rate of interest rates. That means that if it's expenditure and interest, it's under a uh, monetary policy and this one, if it reduces expenditure if it's oh sorry, if it's reduced real interest, that means that it's uh, expansionary monetary policy. Supply side would be contractionary, and then increases the level in the attacks that would be uh, that would be contractionary as well. So one says A, and then for thirty, which represents the total of aggregate demand in a closed economy. So in a closed economy, there's no net exports. All right, so answer is A. Okay, so that's it for this paper. Um, if you have any questions, do comment down below. I'll see you again in the next video, maybe about another passing paper again, probably economics or uh, it probably be, it most likely be economics or, or if not, it probably be mathematics or computer science, but it depends, right? So look to that.